everyone. Welcome to another day of a crash course in music history. And today we're going to be looking at piano and vocal music of the first part of the Romantic era. So let's dive right into it. So um, part of what's going to influence what's going on during this time is the Industrial Revolution. As we're learning to make things uh, with mechanical efficiency, we've got steam to harness now for production. Um, the price of goods are going to come down. We also see politically a lot of small kingdoms being absorbed into larger ones, such as the Kingdom of France or the Austrian Empire. And so what this does mean is the source of funding from all these monarchs that used to fund music is going to kind of disappear. Um, and that means people are going to be working as composers and soloists to make money instead of working for nobility. But it also means that the source of funding is more falling into the growing middle class. People, More people have, are living at a higher standard of living and have money to spend on music, on instruments. Um, pianos and other instruments are now becoming less expensive because of this industrial revolution. Um, just to give you an example, in 1770, the best piano manufacturer in Europe could make at most 20 pianos in a single year. 80 years later, less than 100 years later, in 1850, thanks to steam machinery and specialized labors, uh, a company in Europe could produce 2,000 pianos in a year, and this was John Broadwood and Sons. So piano design changed too. There's a larger range of notes than on the piano now than there were when they first came out. You've got felt-covered hammers, which remember hammers are the part that hit the string. Um, you've got damper pedals that allow the sound to be sustained, and you've got what's called double escapement action now. And that's kind of demonstrated in this little animation here on the left. Um, you see as the hammer's going up and hitting the string and the damper's rising and falling, you see there's this little conical-like thing on the left with a red felt on it, and that catches the hammer as it falls, and there's some other mechanical contraptions that allow the hammer to, uh, to re-hit the string before the key has totally risen again. So that allows for faster playing. Um, and this changed how composers wrote piano music. You see valves now on brass instruments, um, which were inspired by valves from steam engines. So now you could play chromatically. You weren't just limited to the harmonic series. Da, 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 da. You now have got da, 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 da. You've got all the pitches at your disposal now because of valves. The tube is invented. Uh, flutes now go to metal. This is in 1849, thanks to a guy named Theobald uh, Bim. Uh, along with, uh, he also put padded keys on flutes instead of just open tone holes. And they were all linked together with uh, different types of springs and so forth. And this allowed for um, the modern design of the flute that we have now. Uh, and Louis Auguste Buffet, uh, he took these ideas and let, this led to the creation of the modern clarinet as well. And then Adolf Sax, inspired by the modern clarinet, he invented the saxophone. Uh, so. Uh, at this time, ladies are making music at home for the most part, uh, pianist composers are making money teaching them, and music is also coming down in cost because we now have lithography, which is this idea of a stone that you put oily paint on um, and, uh, and some etching, and then you have water that repels the oil and is repelled by the oil, and then you put an oily ink over that, which is attracted to the oily paint, but not to the water, and then you press paper on it. For, anyways, bottom line, cheaper. Cheaper, so more music available. All right, and we see in Romantic Era music, there's a greater variety of harmonies. There's unexpected chord progressions. We'll talk about some of the things that Liszt and Schubert do with that. There's more surprising dissonance. There's less rigid voice leading, which means you aren't just stuck to must only go up in step or in third. Cannot do, you know, you're, you're freer to do whatever at this point. Um, there's more chromaticism. Chromaticism is this idea of moving in half steps. Da, na, 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 na. You hear a lot more of that. There's wilder key changes. There's less clarity even on what key a piece is in at a given moment. You might not even know. You'll see a key signature, but you're like, well, all these accidentals are we really in A flat major. So, you've got all these different changes. Then you've got program music coming to the fore. And you've got more people writing in song cycles, which are uh, modeled after Beethoven's Andi Thorna Geliebte. You remember his set of romantic music? Um, it was a set of songs that all kind of told a story if you sang them in order. Um, so you see people writing with song, song cycles now. 
So the first composer I want to talk about is Franz Schubert. You're going to see a lot of these Romantic era composers didn't live very long, unfortunately. Um, Schubert was no exception. He only lived till he was around 30, uh, 1797 to 1828. He wrote a lot of Lieder. Now remember, Lieder are German songs, uh, German vocal songs. Um, he wrote over 600 of them, plus over 400 other works. I mean, in one given year, he wrote a 140 songs in a single year of his life. He studied with Antonio Salieri in Vienna. Remember the alleged rival of Mozart that some people say killed him? He didn't. Uh, but anyways, um, he was a pianist, a singer, a violinist, an organist. He studied counterpoint and figure bass. Um, 59 of his leader were set to poetry by Johann Goethe, which we talked about him earlier, and you're going to see that name show up a lot. Very, very well-known, famous German poet. Um, Schubert's music was incredibly supportive of the text. It was descriptive. You could really hear what he was trying to, to show with the way he wrote the music, and it was all very supportive of beautiful vocal lines. Um, a perfect example of this is his Lieder Gretchen am, Sch am Spinrade, um, this is Gretchen at the spinning wheel, and I want you to take a listen to at least the first bit of it, um, though I encourage you to listen to the whole thing, and listen to how you can literally hear a spinning wheel spinning in the way he writes the music. And if you listen far enough, you're going to hear when Gretchen starts to get really passionate, dramatic, and she's, sing she's singing about remembering her lover, and she sings about remembering love's kiss, and at that moment, the spinning wheel stops. And it's because she's so overwhelmed that she's not working the spinning wheel anymore. And then you hear the spinning wheel kind of start, and then it picks up again. It's really powerful. So take a listen to Gretchen am Spinrade, and then come back and join us. Now, many of Schubert's leader were set in song cycles, like I mentioned, and many were strophic. Remember, that's repeating music with new text, or they were ternary. That's three parts. So you have part A, you have a B, and then you have A coming back, or you might have A twice, A, A, and then B. Um, so that's, those are examples of ternary. Schubert also composed some symphonies, which we'll look at later. Um, but I want you to look at one more of his leader. This is one of his most technically challenging, especially for the pianist. The pianist part is wild. It's the ballad, which remember ballad tells a story, um, El König, or the Elf King. And uh, this story, this song is through composed, which means you don't have repeating sections. There's no A, B, A. It's just this section for this text, a new section for this text, A, B, C, D, E, F. It's all these new types of music for the words. But it's incredible. Um, the story is, again, another good to poem. And it's about a man and his boy riding through the night on a horse. And the elf king or the earl king shows up and keeps trying to get the boy to come with him. And tells the child, I've got things you can play with, and I'll have nice clothes. And the child keeps going, my father, my father, the, the elf king, he's trying to get me. And the father will turn around and be like, my son, it's just the wind. It's just shadows. It's, you know, you're not, this isn't really happening. And then the elf king is like, well, if you're not going to come with me, I'm going to take you by force. And the child's like, my father, I'm being hurt. And the father rides home, and dramatically, he gets home, and he finds the boy airport dead so it's a you know real happy real feel-good song but incredibly powerful um, I had the privilege of seeing this once with a really great pianist Frankie Bones um, it's a it's an incredible piece and I'd encourage you to take a listen to it and as you do uh, watch for how the guy singing it you can you'll see his facial expressions change and hear his tone change as he takes on the part of the narrator because in the song you have narrator lines the boy speaks, the father speaks, and the Earl King speaks. See if you can detect all those differences as you listen to El König. And like I say, watch the pianist's hands. Like, you basically have to have a seizure to play the song. It's amazing. So take a listen. Now, a couple other successful Romantic era composers and pianists. Robert and Clara Schumann. Uh, Clara Wieck, who married Robert Schumann. Both great composers and pianists in their own right. In fact, Clara was actually the more popular of the two earlier on. And remember, this is unusual. Women were supposed to be making music at home, but she actually was a successful pianist uh, giving concerts. Um, Robert did a lot less performing after he injured his hand, but he was a very influential music critic, and he was an early supporter of Chopin and Brahms. 
Robert lived from 1810 to 1856. He only made it 46 years. Clara lived a bit longer. She lived from 1819 to 1896. Um, both of them wrote a lot of German leader. Together, uh, they would give concerts. Robert would conduct major works while Clara played the piano. Um, unfortunately, uh, Robert literally ended up in an insane asylum for the last two years of his life and died there. Uh, when Robert and Clara married in 1840, Robert presented her a song cycle called Myrten, and the poems are set to it's a set of poems set to music, and it was a gift for their wedding. And the first song I want you to listen to, and this is the only one I'm asking you to listen to from the cycle, but the song I want you to listen to it's called Vidmum, which means dedication, and it was in many ways Robert's love letter to her. Um, I want you to listen to it, Vidmum by Schumann. And um, listen to the incredible pathos, the emotion that's in the piece, and the way the music supports the text. The final lines of it are, you are my better self. Oh, romance goals right there. So, um, and listen to how that word better mm -hmm, floats on a high note and then self sinks down at the end. Um, you can also hear, if you're familiar with it, Franz Schubert's Ave Maria. Schumann quotes that at the end of this song, which maybe is perhaps a further symbolism of their commitment in marriage before God and to cherish one another. It's also a lovely nod to Schubert, who by this time had passed away. Um, again, this was all in Schumann style of trying to capture the essence of the poem in writing the piano and vocal parts as equal partners. This is also ternary, it's ABA. So take a listen to Widmung by Robert Schumann for Clara. A couple other composers we're going to look at, and we're just not giving these composers the amount of time they deserve, but we're going to look at Felix Mendelssohn and Frederick Chopin, who were two other famous pianists of this era, um, but for very different reasons. Mendelssohn was a Jewish-German composer, though when he was very young, his family converted to Christianity. He began composing at 11, and he was compared to Mozart for his uh, piano abilities and for his style. He wasn't a big fan of the crazy virtuosity of his day. Um, like Liszt and Chopin that we're going to see in just a moment. Um, he felt it was just, as he put it, a bunch of acrobatics on the piano without much substance. Um, in 1843, he founded the Leipzig Conservatory, and Robert and Clara Schumann were some of the first faculty there. Um, Mendelssohn also lived a short life. He only lived from 1809 to 1847, so he lived less than 40 years. Um, a great set of examples of his music, his piano writing, are his songs without words. And these were written over many years of his lifetime, compiled in eight books. Um, and I've got a link to the full set of them on your playlist, unless you're doing Spotify. And I want you to listen to one of them. Pick any one. They're all great. I personally, in the first two books, I'm partial to number four in book one and number six in book two. Uh, yeah, number six in book two. Um, but you can listen to any of them. You're going to hear that they kind of mirror German Lieder, which is vocal music, um, in the way they're written. They're very tuneful. You hear a very beautiful tune brought out very carefully over the background. Um, and you'll hear, if you can follow the score on any of these, you'll often see that there's a lot of extra notes going on in the right hand, but the right hand also has to bring out the melody to rise over that. This is an example of the new capabilities of the piano, like a harpsichord couldn't do. Um, and it's a little bit of a technical challenge for a pianist. So I'm going to want you to listen to any one of his songs without words. Um, and then come back. So pause this video because there's actually more on this slide and take a listen to that. Okay, now that you've listened to Mendelssohn, let's talk a little bit about Chopin. Now, Mendelssohn, Schubert, and Schumann were all experimenting with orchestral music, but Chopin pretty much wrote exclusively for the piano. He was a Polish composer, though where he was born was kind of under Russian influence at the time. And while his mother was Polish, his father was French. Um, at age seven, he began publishing music and performing publicly. Like, what am I doing with my life? Uh, he eventually moved to Paris where he stayed for the rest of his life. He also li uh, lived a short life as well. He was only 39 when he died. Um, he made his money from charging big bucks for lessons, and for the few concerts that he would give, he charged big money because he was so well-known and popular, people would pay the money. Wealthy people would send their daughters to take lessons from him, and he was a little bit of a playboy, um, but, you know, Chopin. Uh, 
He was known for his piano pieces that were very, a lot of them are stylized dances. If it's a waltz, a mazurka, or a polonaise, these are all types of dances, and they very much take advantage, again, of what a piano is capable of with that double escapement action. You can play really quickly, um, which, like the Erlkönig, which wouldn't have been possible without that double escapement action. Many of his mazurkas and polonaises reflected his Polish heritage, and you're going to hear some militaristic sounds in some of those. Uh, the mazurka, in fact, is a stylized Polish dance. What I want you to listen to is at least the first two minutes of his polonaise in A flat major. You're going to hear some of that virtuosity that Mendelssohn probably wasn't was referencing when he said it was just all acrobatics. You're going to hear lots of rubato, which is stretching of the tempo in one or both hands, and some really dramatic flourishes. So listen to his polonaise in A flat major and then come back and join us. All right, and last but not least, if there was an Elvis Presley of the 19th century in Europe, it was Franz Liszt, our last pianist for the day. Uh, Liszt was a performer, conductor, champion of contemporary and historical music. He invented the master class, which is this idea of you get some a group together and someone's up front playing and a teacher's working with them in front of everyone else. Uh, he uh, really brought to the fore the symphonic poem, which is music without words, that also tells a story, um, not unlike a song cycle, though one song and it's a poem, um, but again, without words. Uh, his father worked for the Esterhazys, and if you remember them, that's who, do you remember which composer worked for them? Right, Haydn. Haydn worked for them. Um, so his father worked for them, and Liszt studied with his father until his father moved them to Vienna, where then Liszt had a chance to study with Carl Czerny, uh, who was another pianist composer of the era, as well as studying counterpoint and theory with, again, Antonio Salieri, the alleged murderer of Mozart. See, this guy really was well known in his time. He wasn't just some, as the movie says, patron saint of mediocrity. Um, Liszt was giving concerts at age 11. Again, what am I doing with my life? He was given, a, when, so get this, he moved to Vienna and a piano manufacturer there, when this kid was, 11, 12, not long after he moved to Vienna, gave him a brand new full grand piano with the new double escapement action because he was just awesome. And he learned to exploit the possibilities of that instrument. He gave a lot of concerts during the first half of his career, over a thousand. Um, and he, uh, and this was unusual because giving just solo concerts as a pianist was unheard of at the time. You usually had something else paired with it. It wasn't just piano concerts. And this is where the word recital comes from. It's thanks to Liszt. Recital is a piano concert, basically. Many of his tunes reflect his Hungarian roots. He used gypsy melodies. He did a lot of piano transcriptions or arrangements of existing orchestral music or leader. Um, and he experimented a lot with all kinds of crazy harmonic things. We talked in Westwinds about circle of fifths, going from D to A to E, um, or the other direction, using the dominance. Uh, he would do a circle of thirds, major thirds, which managed to divide an octave successfully into equal sections. So you go from D, um, or sorry, from D flat, go up to F, that's a major third, go from F to A, that's a major third, go from A to C sharp, which is the enharmonic spelling of D flat, and you're back up the octave again. So this was, this was a new thing that was pioneered by Schubert. Um, he used a lot of chromaticism, those are those half steps, da 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 da. Um, and he was just a technical virtuoso, and a good example of that is his un suspiro, which means a sigh. And I want you to listen to, um, I'd love you to listen to the whole thing, but at least listen to the first bit, and follow the score. You're going to see these crazy runs in the left hand up to the right hand and back down to the left hand, but what you're going to see happening also, it looks like you need a third hand to play the melody up top. And what happens is, the left hand starting the run, the right hand takes over the one, the left hand crosses over, plays a note in the melody, the right hand's coming down, the left hand takes over the one, the right hand plays the next note in the melody, and you have this back and forth, and it's crazy! Also, he had big hands, so he could play big chords, which you'll see at measure 36. Um, just absolutely incredible. So this is your last thing for today. Take a listen to Un Suspiro, and enjoy, and I'll see you tomorrow.